speaking. It uh, goes back in terms of, it's about as old as my injury, which I'm going to come on to in a moment and, and share some snippets of that with you. Um, and I've been active with the charity, not only as a beneficiary, but also as, a, as an ambassador. So if you like a spokesperson helping to represent our wounded community of, of veterans sort of nationwide, as I mentioned for about the last 10 years. So who am I? In fairness, I was an ordinary Joe getting on with my life. And if I turn the clock back, and please don't hold this against me, ladies and gents, in my earlier career, um, I was a police officer, not here in Hertfordshire, but in the, um, in the Thames Valley. So it covers Buckinghamshire to the north, Oxfordshire and the Royal County of Berkshire in the south. So just west of London, that whole sector, there are about five and a half thousand officers. And I was just one of those back in the day. But I'm, I'm going back quite a while now on, on the sort of clock. And I did that role sort of chasing 999s, um, shift patterns, days, lates, nights, and sort of, you know, getting up to all sorts as, as most police officers do. So I just wanted to share that with you in terms of the early history of what I used to get up to. And also big shout out while I'm here, in that sense, to your local constabulary, because I think often uh, police officers and indeed the support elements associated with that, so uh, the police, the uh, police community support officers and the staff, often don't get a shout out, they don't get a mention. It's not an easy job and I know that from experience and uh, it can be quite demanding on the officers and the support themselves because of the 24 hour nature of that service and so I'd just like to share that with you in the sort of you know generic sense that you know they're worthy of our sort of um, general support and, and respect within the community. So shout out to Hockertshire uh, Constabulary here covering this, this Hemel area. My story continued from there and I actually took a sabbatical from the police force in the early years. So I'd only served uh, about a five year stint and then chose to do something because I had an ambition to fulfill, if you like, um, um, experience within a, a larger sort of global picture. And so if you will, Thames Valley Police and the confines of, you know, uh, Bucks, Oxfordshire, Berkshire, probably wasn't enough to contain my younger self. So I wanted to do something bigger, and actually the armed forces, in terms of what's relevant with me being here today with, to speak to you guys, was my focus. That became my focus. And I took this sabbatical where I was granted some time out from my, um, my bosses with Thames Valley Police at the time, and, and off I went. Um, initially, I went off to to, uh, to do some expedition work in the world and sort of get a few things out of my system. Um, and I was working specifically within the in the dive sector, um, running very remote expeditions in places as far as um, uh, sort of Philippines, Egypt, and also within the Caribbean. And once I got back, my ambition, as I mentioned, was to join Her Majesty's Armed Forces. But what was it that I was going to do? What captured my inspiration, if you will, at the time, and what would sort of drive me forwards as a, as a younger serviceman? You know, young paratroopers uh, during, you know, and pre the, uh, the build up to, to the war effort. And we all know what paratroopers do. They jump out of perfectly serviceable aircraft uh, with sort of loads on their back, and then they sort of effectively go in and soldier on the ground. A lot of those early paratroopers were instrumental in our fight with UK armed forces, um, certainly in areas not too far away, um, down in, in France and indeed across Holland, against our adversaries and the opposition back then during the war. So I was inspired by paratroopers, hence why I volunteered and signed up to the course. And I did surprise myself, I, rem I remained robust, largely avoided sort of major injury apart from a few bumps and bruises and grazes and generally being quite beaten up by the end of it but i did get through the process and then i was uh, if you like um, um eligible to join the parachute regiment but when i got back to unit um, now this was back to cambridge otc i was actually invited to move forwards and try it out for a different type of selection program so this was specifically for UK Special Forces and I'd considered it 
but not really thought that I was necessarily the right material. Indeed, I had the fears, and I didn't know whether I was going to be uh, successful at that game, that game plan. Uh, but what's the worst that can happen? We have an ambition, we put ourselves forward, we volunteer, we may fail. We may fall over, but we need to pick ourselves up again. And I guess that's why I'm here ultimately to share my wider story with you today. So I embarked on this training program with the UK Special Forces. So I did a selection process uh, as a reservist, which lasted for approximately 13 months, not knowing what the result was and not knowing whether indeed I was going to be successful. But I kept at it and I kept sort of pushing the boundaries on what I thought I was capable of. And within, by the end of the 13 months, I'd basically done about six months in the hills, followed by about another six, seven months of a further continuation process before um, I was actually successful again, largely thanks to the fact that I remained robust and avoided injury and managed to hold fast with the ambition and that tenacity to get through the process. Now, it's not so much of a boast, and I'm going to come on to effectively part two, and the dramatisation of what happened to Jamie Hull in terms of the new life and version 2.0. So I'll just pause for a moment. Interested to hear. You may be curious. So there I was, a young buck for all intents and purposes. I so I, I got badged into UK UKSF, and specifically I had a role with um, 21 SAS. I can say that now because I'm actually out in the sort of public domain and I'm sort of medically discharged and retired from all of that. Because what happened next was a real shock to the system of the greatest magnitude. And again, it's not so much of a boast, but in terms of the gravitas of what I came through and what I, what I sustained and what I endured, I think I'm qualified to, to actually make that statement. Uh, I came through probably the greatest type of uh, trauma no, known to man. And, 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 and indeed what happened was, I had a newfound ambition. So this goes back to the summer of 2007. So there I was, this young guy, and I'd been with my squadron, uh, with the UKSF uh, reserve role, for, a, for about a five year period. My ambition was to learn to fly. Indeed, I was inspired by my late grandfather who trained as a pilot with the Royal Air Force and we have a treat as uh, Mr Mayor has mentioned to you uh, coming through shortly um, so my ambition was to learn to fly I decided to not just talk the talk but to walk the walk and I got my visa to learn to fly specifically I chose to go to the US US airspace and I went out to Florida on the eastern seaboard of the United States of America <coughs> and I embarked upon a full-time comprehensive flying training program. And there I was pinching myself because this is how far my younger self had come. I'd been a police officer. I'd done P Company and a range of other military courses that I could probably wag my tail about. I was indeed badged UK Special Forces and now I was not only learning to fly, but I was now qualified to, to fly solo. I was in the air at altitude. I was at an indicated altitude looking at my altimeter of approximately 1,200 feet above the ground on that eastern seaboard of Florida on the 19th of August 2007, pinching myself, relishing the life that I was living at the time, looking forwards, looking as far as I could see. It was like Simpsons weather on the day. I don't forget it, blue skies, puffy clouds. And I'm looking forwards, looking at that Atlant the Atlantic breakers coming in. And again, I'm one over 1,000 feet indicated altitude in the air, flying solo. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I looked out my left-hand canopy window to my left. I saw a thin streak of visible yellow, orange flame. Clearly it was flame, it was fire, and it was emanating from the front portion of the fuselage. It had breached the cockpit when I made my final turn into wind at approximately 1,000 feet, having just relayed my position to air traffic control. The tower 
down below. Looked down at my feet on the rudder pedals working left and right below me. The flame had breached, it started to lap around my feet and ankles. I started to panic, I started to fluster. <laughs> I'm thinking about what's going on. I'm trying to process it cognitively, thinking about it all, taking it all in, thinking what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do, gotta get this aircraft down. Sat there, left hand skipper's seat in control of the aircraft. Left hand on the control stick in between my knees, right hand on the throttle in the center column. I'm descending, 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 looking at altimeter in front of me. Altimeter was reading 1,000 feet when the fire breached. Now through, it's spinning down 900 feet, 800 feet, 700 feet now on altimeter. <laughs> Thinking about it, my mind is still flustered. 600 feet, 500 feet, ground is approaching, runway in the distance. Admittedly, initially, there was panic. There was fluster not good. In the military, we call that flapping. Flapping. That means you're not in control. Adrenaline is perhaps taking over the moment and you've got to deal with it. If adrenaline is too heightened, you know that fight or flight response, that can overwhelm you. Indeed, you will be flustered, you can make errors, you can make mistakes and in essence you can screw up. I didn't want to screw up that day. I had a light bulb moment at approximately 500 feet. I gently veered my stick to the left hand side and veered away from the concrete runway in the distance below. I headed away from the concrete runway, indeed towards a grassy embankment. Through 500 feet indicated, 400 feet, 300 feet. I'm now just watching altimeter and following emergency protocol. And I quote in my recollection of this, one of the previous US flight instructors said to me, if you've got a problem and there's an emergency, fly the damn aircraft. And I considered these words, they echoed and they reverberated through my mind. And I'm thinking about it all, and despite the fact that it was all on top a moment ago, and I was in a fluster, and I was, a panic, I was in a panic, admittedly, I managed to get a grip, like I said. I followed the emergency protocol. I turned the key to the ignition off. The red switches for magnetos, alpha, bravo, off, off. Master switch, off. Lights, off. Strobes, off. In the center column, fuel pump, off. Rotate fuel selector valve, off. Rotate that through some 90 degrees. Everything off, off, off. Sounds complex? Not really. I just followed the dashboard from left to right as I've been taught in the emergency flight drill over and over again. We've never actually practiced it for real, but we've gone through the drill. And that's what it's all about, training. You fall back on your training, you follow the drill, you follow the protocol. They're designed to get you out of hot water, out of trouble. The trouble that I faced was that I was now burning flames up to the chest, 400 feet, 300 feet. I unbuckled my three-point harness over the waist, over my left and right hand shoulder, ripped off my headset because comms at that stage with air traffic control was futile. I ripped it off, tossed it in the right hand footwell. I was worried about the flex lead cable being a hindrance and getting in my way and perhaps uh, being a hindrance around the neck. Headset removed. I'd unbuckled the harness like I mentioned. 200 feet, I'm looking forwards, looking left, looking right, looking for hazards, looking for traffic, looking for obstacles, anything that could be in my path, anything that could be a problem for what I was about to do. From 200 feet, 100 feet low level, I'd scrubbed off as much airspeed as I dared. Running in now, looking forward, looking left, looking right. Thinking about it still, <laughs> flames starting to lap my face, indeed flames around my eyes, one eye shut in a vein bit to protect my eyesight, hyperventilating through the corner of my mouth to perfect, protect myself from flame ingress, to protect my airway. Very low level now, 50 feet, looking forwards, looking left, looking right, 40 feet, 30 feet, 20 feet, approximately 20 feet running in at approximately 
30 knots, which is about 32, 33 miles per hour, 20 feet, like Jack Rabbit, I managed to clamber onto the left hand wing. So climbing up onto the seat, out through the door aperture, which was open to my left, onto the left wing, and I went for it. I looked left at the horizon, not down, hands above my head in the prayer position. I took a giant leap from the trailing edge of that left wing, snapped my feet and knees together in the air, if you like good old fashioned British Army parachute exit position, boom. I landed like a sack of spuds. Little did I realise the damage was done. I landed feet first, thank God. I thrust forwards, face planted the grass. In terms of injury or trauma or medical diagnosis, I inadvertently had ruptured my large intestine, lacerated my liver which was hemorrhaging and bleeding internally. I was 63% third and fourth degree burns. And fourth degree burns means it's down to the bone. That was my lower shins that had sustained the longer period of burn. I hyperextended my left index finger a bit awkwardly, which fractured. Fractured a couple of ribs with the impact, fractured my right clavicle, which is my collarbone. So multiple fractures to face and indeed torso area, left finger, internal injuries that I mentioned, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it was that I was 63% third and fourth degree burn. That was the life changer. Unfortunately, folks, I had to hang my boots up with the military. No longer was I going to be that um, operational member of UK Special Forces. That guy was gone. That was version 1.0. Unfortunately, we'd never have that same body uh, to be able to run to be able to run with the military and, and work at that tempo anymore. So it's not so much of a sob story, but more I like to think of I'm one of the lucky ones because not only over the course of time did I manage to bounce back, but remarkably, I actually made a very strong recovery. And this, folks, is how I did it. So I was in the hospital for six months, drug-induced because of the severity of the trauma that I sustained, which I highlighted a moment ago. All that going on, six months, very dark place. But I was drug-induced, so for the record, I didn't really suffer. And it kind of kept me asleep. After six months, I wake up in a hospital in Chelmsford, having been repatriated. Shout out to the nurses out there, but this one, I remember specifically an Essex nurse bless her, at uh, Chelmsford Hospital on the Central Burns Unit for, for the UK. Suddenly, it was a bit of a rude awakening. I think they sort of reduced the, um, the drugs that they were giving me to sort of wake me up. And the Essex nurse sort of bending my ear saying, all right, Jamie, we've got to get you moving now, my love. We've got to get you up and about, and we've got to start getting you mobile. But it's going to take time, because you've been laid up for six months. Little did I realise. And I actually spent the next one and a half years in the hospital and endured some 63 surgeries under general anaesthetic over the course of the next seven years. Which is ironic because you remember I was 63% third degree burn. But if you will, the magic of my story is, and my message to all of you, is effectively that with great will and determination, all of us can overcome life's greatest obstacles. And the way that I did this as an individual was that I never stopped pushing the boundary. I may not have been that same gentleman that I described earlier on as the young buck, that young cut and thrust soldier. Remember that guy had been too badly sort of uh, traumatized and wounded to continue. But with the right mindset, with the right determination, I was still able to surprise myself. I was still able to go on, push the envelope on what I thought was possible. So despite some nerve damage to my lower limbs and some effective disability, I actually went on to participate in a range of um, challenges. I learned to walk and to read, uh, sorry, to write my name and to feed myself in the hospital all over again. By the third year, I was actually back to walking about eight miles per day in a bid to rehabilitate myself. 
By the end of the third year, I managed to get a place on the London Marathon for charity. I couldn't run it, but I power walked it as best that my little leggies would carry me. And I managed to achieve London Marathon in some eight hours and 30 minutes. I then got a place, um, sort of very fortunately, in New York to do the same thing uh, through the boroughs of New York the following year. So we're going back about sort of 10 years now. And I did New York to the best of my power walking, you know, left foot, right foot, sort of left foot continued. And this time I managed to push the envelope seven hours and seven minutes. And then I did one more London Marathon. I use this as an example to, to paint a picture here. But one more London Marathon for, I believe it was Health Heroes number three, back in London, and six hours and 15 minutes to the very best of my power walking ability. And look out for the screenplay, which is coming soon. And I hope that you've enjoyed some of what I've had to share with you today. And I'm gonna wind up now and just say, have a fantastic Armed Forces Day. Enjoy the weekend overhead, very short. For the record, that was a hurricane, um, an archived aircraft from World War II. And uh, yeah, I think, I think we're all pretty privileged, all of us, that, that they managed to get that fly past him. It was supposed to be a couple of Spitfires, but due to the wind, they, um, they couldn't quite make it. But obviously the hurricane, we are, I think we're truly blessed. And, and look at that, the sun's breaking through as well. Enjoy.
So I chose to go off to university and I embarked upon a, a sort of higher education course. Specifically, I did a languages degree, 